All right, everybody, we are going on to screening and treatments for cancer. And to talk about why it's important to do screenings and how we target treatments, we first have to understand uh, the etiology or cause of cancer. So this is another uh, bit of slide information from the National Cancer Institute, which is talking about things that we know are associated with the development of cancers. So within the individual, we have diet, we have the genetic information, so the heredity uh, coming from uh, the DNA, so those are things that are built in, and typically we see things uh, lasting quite a few generations. Uh, we think that information that's stored in the way that DNA is wound uh, can last for at least three generations. There's different dietary measures that have been associated with the development of certain cancers. So for example, um, there is a correlation between a low fiber, high red meat diet, and colon cancer. Uh, there's also a link between um, colon cancer and eating foods that have been cooked on a grill. Uh, so it can be a variety of things. It could be different hormones. Uh, breast cancer in females is an estrogen-derived cancer, meaning the higher estrogen is the more likelihood of a breast tumor. And in males, we see testosterone being the driving factor with the development of prostate cancer. There's some chemicals in the environment, so that can include um, like BPAs, organophosphates, things that are sprayed in the ground, um, inhaled chemicals and smoke, viruses and bacteria. Um, some specific ones are up here, so HIV, the different hepatitis viruses, so uh, B and C, and D particularly, um, human papillomavirus or HPV is a very specific virus associated with cervical cancer, throat cancer. And then we also have um, exposure to radiation. And we know that we can cause cancer with radiation, but we can also utilize the way radiation damages normal cells to target uh, quickly growing cells. So taking a look at the way we understand at a basic level, um, I'm just going to kind of go into the basics of genetics and cancer. When we look at the way uh, DNA is wound around these histone proteins, there's this wonderful double helical structure with these paired bases and everything looks really nice because there's a lot of different proofreading mechanisms to be sure that this all looks correctly. And when we call something a carcinogen, meaning that's associated with cancer and the development of cancer, that means that it has the ability to unwind the DNA and then cause some specific alteration to the way that those uh, bases are paired. So all those things we just mentioned, those carcinogenic agents, um, they have a way of accessing that genetic material and then altering it. And those are called DNA mutations, which can range from unzipping the DNA to just having a single base that's changed. Having one little base change can alter dramatically the function of proteins in the body. And as we know, proteins make up cells, which make up tissues, which make up organs. So we're at a very, very small level, but it has really large changes. We can add specific bases. We can delete bases. This is making the original copy of the DNA, which is packaged in every single cell, abnormal, meaning that the cell is not likely to function as a normal tissue cell. And when we think about big families of genes or normal growth pathways, we're talking about things called growth factors, typically. So I've mentioned one so far, it's um, VEGF, so vascular endothelial growth factor. Whenever ischemic tissue needs a blood supply, it releases VEGF, so that VEGF uh, would bind to a receptor on a cell, um, in this case it would be on a, a vessel cell, to encourage more vessel cell growth. So it does so by binding to its receptor and then activating the signal cascade inside of the cell so that we can now use the DNA, which is essentially a recipe book of all the different proteins in the body, uh, read that DNA and then have some sort of growth of another cell. So we want this cell, which would be a vascular cell of a blood vessel, we want it to split into additional uh, blood vessel cells so that they can start growing and vascularizing that tissue. 
um, there's epidermal growth factor. So when we need more epidermis, which uh, happens in normal tissue healing, epidermal growth factor binds to its receptor, and then there's a signaling cascade, transcription, translation, more cells. So this is a nice uh, normal growth control pathway. And we refer to these, these growth factors, these normal things, as proto-oncogenes or prototypical oncogenes. And you might know that onco is associated with cancer. So like an oncologist is a doctor who studies cancer. And a prototype is an original of something. So proto-oncogenes are the original cells before they go through any kind of mutation events. And in normal growth that we see in healing and just with typical death of cells um, through their normal processes, they are sloughed away. And then we have um, the activation of these pathways, which work in a really controlled manner. And we see that the genes that regulate these processes, they can mutate. So we have our nice normal pink cells. They're all going to be pink in these pictures, the normal cells, with the regular um, you know, growth factor regulated growth. Whereas cancerous cells, we can see these growth factors and the receptors associated with them, they can become mutated. And oncogenes in general are a large family of mutated proto-oncogenes or growth factors that do something that we call gain of function. They allow that cell to make way more copies of itself than would typically be allowed in normal tissue uh, healing or regeneration. So those prototypical oncogenes, those proto-oncogenes, normal growth factor pathways, when they become mutated, we refer to them as oncogenes. So they're a large family of, of signals that throughout the process of cells dividing become mutated. And if we take a look at this picture here, so here's our cancerous cell, and it's just one of these abnormal pleomorphic cells. And it looks different than our, the pink normal tissue cells, meaning it's undergone a mutation. And in this mutation, the receptor would, would bind um, the typical growth factor now is made inactive, meaning all the intracellular things of that cascade are inactive too. Those are all proteins. Instead, we have um, a signaling protein from an active oncogene coming in abnormally and then binding to the DNA and doing whatever it wants to. So if this was an epidermal cell, so like here's epidermis, so this would be maybe a skin cancer that's growing. Instead of epidermal growth factor binding, we had a cell mutation, and now this abnormal uh, mutated oncogene now it doesn't even have to bind to a receptor. It just comes right in and it binds to the DNA and encourages that cell to make more copies of itself. So now it can divide very quickly and we don't have to wait for expression of factors that would be present only in normal circumstances. Some other things that can mutate, um, which are called loss of function genes. So again, oncogenes are gain of function, meaning that the cells gain the function to replicate more quickly. Uh, loss of function means it's a mutation that allows the cell to lose a normal capability. So there's a family of genes called tumor suppressor genes, and they affect cancerous growth. And they help suppress proliferation of abnormal cells. When you have a mutation to a tumor suppressor gene, just like their name, tumor suppressor, they suppress tumor, or tumor growth, if that mutates, then uh, this is something that is now inactive. There's no suppression of growth. Um, when you damage these, you get cancerous growth. This is also a pattern that can be inherited, meaning if you have a defective copy, uh, that can be passed on, making these things familial. So tumor suppressor genes can mutate so that we lose uh, proliferative functions of the cell. Um, another thing that can lose its function are DNA repair genes. These are a large family of proofreader genes that make sure just like your autocorrect or your uh, spelling check on uh, like Word, Microsoft Word, you run your spell check and it makes sure everything is spelled correctly and uh, organized correctly and everything is great. And you have um, DNA enzyme 
pairs essentially that read through these base pairs to make sure it looks good and that cell is not abnormal and it's not going to copy itself in an erratic manner. But if there is a mutation of any of these repair genes, we can have deletions or mismatches. And now we have abnormal DNA, abnormal cell making copies of itself. So this would be another loss of function type of mutation. DNA repair is a normal function. When these genes mutate, we now lose that ability to proofread or repair genes as they're assembled. Here's a little table for you to study with our proto-oncogenes, their normal function of growth, and what the malfunctions will be. Uh, suppressor genes, DNA repair genes, so we have our loss of function down here with tumor suppressor and DNA repair, and our gain of function oncogene mutations. And remember that each time you make a copy of something, it looks less and less like the normal tissue. So this is a... Um, a possible way to think about going through this type of paradigm. There's one single cell here that has become abnormal. It doesn't undergo apoptosis, so now it's allowed to make copies of itself. So the first uh, mutation inactivates the suppressor gene, which would suppress the cell from copying itself. So now the cell's allowed to proliferate. And now it's growing, it's growing, it's copying itself, and now it's got a family of cells that are abnormal and have a loss of function of proliferation. And in the next uh, couple mutations, we have an inactivation of a DNA repair gene. So that would mean we have two things that are now abnormal. We have lost the control of proliferation and the control of proofreading. And on the third uh, timeline here of events, we have a mutation of these proto-oncogene like growth factor regulators mutating into oncogenes, which now can grow at their own uh, rapid pace without any control overall. And the more times these cells divide, they're going to look less and less like the normal tissue and the normal um, cells in that area. And we can also see that the cell has now made a family of itself so large that it requires vascularization. And we've started to see these vessels grow in, um, making it more likely not only that it grows in size and mass, but also that it has the ability to metastasize. You will see that a lot of cancer therapeutics now involved autoimmune or immuno um, types of therapies. There are immune cells called natural killer cells that I go over in the immune chapter. And one of the abilities of natural killer cells is to spot um, some abnormal cancerous cells and kill them very quickly. So there's an idea that if the immune system isn't functioning normally, then these mutations are able to go on um, without as much oversight as a nice, strong, healthy immune system. So there's ways that we've tried to think about treating these cancers that help to restore immune function, but also uh, utilize the function of normal immune cells. Just a little note about heredity and tumors. Uh, it, there's not a lot that we know about um, specific genes and their regulation and association with cancer types. So even though there's these 23andMe and ancestry DNA accounts where you can test for a variety of different markers, um, we just know a small piece of the puzzle. So something that got a lot of news were these BRCA1 and 2 genes. So these are breast cancer associated genes, and there's two of them. And if you have one of these in your genetic code, um, your risk of cancer is elevated, of breast cancer. If you have both of them, it's even more elevated. So if these things go together, and there's also known family history of breast cancer, and these are found in a screening, then it can be concluded that there is a heightened chance of breast cancer in that individual. And the reason I have Angelina Jolie up here is because she had a mother who died from an estrogen-related cancer. She has a lot of children, so she had her genetic code tested and found that she possessed both of these genes. So she decided on an elective mastectomy, um, which means you have no breast tissue. And if there's no breast tissue, native breast tissue, then there's no chance of breast cancer, especially a metastatic breast cancer. But just to put this in perspective, 80 to 90% of patients with breast cancer did not have a family history. 
uh, 10% of cases of human breast cancer have been linked to gene mutations. So that's, it's not a, gr it's a small predictability. I want you to understand that. We know that it leads to an increase in the susceptibility to it, but it doesn't, it's not set in stone. It is something that when we think about somebody being a genetic counselor or using genetic information, it can help make informed decisions uh, with the patient. Um, and then also taking that into account with known family histories and other risk factors. Okay, so thinking about the genetic kind of alterations, those are all very small changes at the level of the genetic code in the cell, which means early types of cancerous uh, gross are not going to have a lot of symptoms associated with them, which is why screening is so important. So that can be uh, accomplished by a variety of different tests. Some of them are typical tests. They happen at a regular interval. Some of them would only be initiated if there was a specific need um, or a finding that would be indicative of further testing. So a little uh, mnemonic for you to remember is caution. So things that are, are warning signs or could be warning signs um, are a good idea to get checked out. So the chi goes with, or chi, the C goes with change in bowel or bladder habits or function. So that could be an increase or decrease in constipation, in pain, um, a lot of time without having defecation or urination things of that nature, um, that could be indicative of different bowel cancers or with um, urination, especially in males, that can be associated with prostate cancer because of its association with the bladder. A is for a sore that doesn't heal. We saw squamous cell sarcomas, so we know that those are penetrating lesions, and they start out looking like a sore, and they keep on penetrating through the skin. So if it's something that doesn't seem to heal in a typical amount of time, then that's something you might want to have checked out. Unusual bleeding or discharge. So that could be vaginal bleeding, GI bleeding, bleeding in the mouth, bleeding um, with upset stomach. Uh, discharge from the urethra in males or females, or from breast tissue in males or females, um, or in saliva or other secretions from the skin. T is for thickening or lump in the breast or elsewhere. So thickening of tissue, remember when I said things are hard and when they're non-mobile, they're um, a little bit more worrisome than if they were soft and able to be moved. Thickening is an actual thickening of the tissue, and remember for breast cancers, it's most common for them to be in the nipple region uh, because those are the parts of the breast that undergo changes once a month with the menstrual cycle. Indigestion or difficulty swallowing, those could be indicative of esophageal, mouth cancers, um, throat cancers. O, obvious change in a wart or mole. We went over the rules of the mole. So if they get bigger, if they change colors, if their borders become abnormal, or if they're new, uh, those should be checked out. Or a nagging cough or hoarseness can be associated with pharyngeal um, or throat cancers. So all good things uh, to alert somebody to perhaps schedule a visit and talk about their symptoms so that the appropriate test can be scheduled. Some things that happen as part of normal screening, um, it used to be that when females were sexually active um, or when they got their period, they would be scheduled for their first pap smear. Now, um, we know that there's a higher likelihood of abnormal pap smears uh, in early adolescence. So they've changed the age a couple of times in the last few years. So now they're recommending that women at least like at 21 go for a regular pap smear, which is essentially just a swab and a check of the tissue of the exocervix, so the external part of the cervix that's most in contact with the vaginal environment. So here's a normal pap smear, nice normal tissue, normal looking cells. And here is an abnormal pap smear. We can see the darkly stained nuclei and the loss of stratification, so very abnormal cells up near the top. So this would first prompt um, a second pap smear, and then they do a 
I use a microscope to look very, very close to check out the uh, appearance of the tissue. And if necessary, that is sent off for further testing. The good thing about cervical cancer is that, remember, it's mainly that um, carcinoma in C2 is cervical cancer. So when that's removed, if there's the ecto or exocervix removed, uh, what they do is just kind of sew up the cervical canal because the cervix is really there to support the fetus as it's growing. Um, so that's a pap smear. So that's done every year. Um, when women are done having kids, it's now every three years. Okay. Breast cancer screening, this is a mammogram or mammography. So this woman doesn't look super happy and that's because this is a dual x-ray. And the breast is put on a plate and the x-ray technician will squish the breast tissue down as uh, thin as it will go to look at uh, the appearance of the breast tissue underneath um, an x-ray. Uh, it, this is sometimes criticized as only being able to find really large masses, uh, not really small masses, but it still is used as a typical screen. Usually after the age of 45, women go and have a regular mammogram to check for abnormalities. It's still recommended that women do a self-breast examination once a month to check for any thickening or lumps, specifically nipple changes, and then checking for any abnormal secretions from the nipple duct or the milk duct. Um, as that could be indicative of an issue. Other blood tests are not, uh, some are done every year, some are done if necessary, uh, if there's a history or any reason that that person might have a risk factor. Some interesting ones, uh, the CEA is something that is just collected through the blood and it's elevated in cancer or cases of GI tract cancers, pancreatic cancer, and breast cancer. Alpha fetoprotein is a interesting finding because this is something that's actually looked at in amniocentesis to check for neural tube defects in a young embryo. Um, in cases of liver cancer, there's actually detectable alpha fetoprotein, which is, again, abnormal. You wouldn't expect that to be in anything other than a pregnant female. Same thing with that HCG, human chorionic growth hormone, that is secreted by some uh, testicular cancers. HCG is only present when there is a blastocyst that's burrowed into the wall of a uterus that has started to develop into an embryo. So again, you would only see that normally in a pregnant female. Acid phosphatase is elevated in prostate cancer, and one of the newest uh, blood tests is CSA, which is a cervical cancer blood test. So these are low cost, they're very low invasive types of tests, and they just involve drawing of blood and then sending out to pathology. There is colon cancer screening, you've probably heard of colonoscopies, which are a flexible scope that's inserted through the colon, uh, and there's a guide camera there so that the physician can check the appearance of the colon. So these can either be done starting at the age of 50 as part of normal care routines, because we know that colon cancer is one of the top three cancers in the United States. So it is recommended that adults go um, after they're 50 every couple of years. However, this can be something that is ordered if there is a positive fecal occult blood test. And as I've mentioned before, occult is something that cannot be seen, like occult activity. Um, so fecal occult blood test is blood that's not frank blood, but if there are abnormalities with um, changes to bowel movements with bowel consistency, a fecal occult blood test can be ordered really cheaply that would check for the presence of occult blood. And if this test was positive, then the physician will order a colonoscopy no matter what the age is of the patient because bleeding in the GI tract is very indicative of GI gross and cancers. And when I say things are sent out for pathology, um, we're talking about taking a tissue biopsy. So that can either be a small punch of tissue or that can be a blood draw. And the pathology that we're learning about is taking things, putting them underneath a microscope and seeing if they look normal or abnormal uh, to the naked eye or 
uh, in gross pathology or in molecular pathology. So that could be separating out the proteins to look at uh, proteomics is the field where you're looking at different protein expressions. There's also genomics, which is isolating the genetic information um, from that sample and looking at gene expression. And these things all together not only help tell you if it's cancerous, but also help tell you um, what type of cancer we believe that it is and help to tailor a treatment plan for that patient. Without uh, pathology, there's no medicine. So pathology is extremely important. And as we've talked before, um, one of the important things about the pathologic finding is staging and grading. So we have um, stages of cancer, one, two, three, four, but also TNM staging, the tumor, the nodes, and if it's metastasized or not. And then there's also grades of tumors, and those grades have to do with the pathology of that cell and then how quickly that cell is dividing, how large the nucleus is, what the cytoplasmic ratio to nucleus ratio looks like, what the variation between cells is in their size and shape, whether or not the cells retain their specialized features, if those cells are organized, and if there's a tumor boundary or not. That uh, finding of all of these things taken together will give you a grade for the cancer. So the grade is for the pathology and the stage is more the anatomic location of the cancer. So here we have patient survival rate on the y-axis, and we have years on the x, and this is looking at the relationship between the outlook or the prognosis and what grade was given to that tumor um, by the pathologist. And if it was a very low grade, even five years out, we see that the survival rate is quite high because that was a slow-growing tumor. The cells look pretty normal or at least not as normal as norm as the typical tissue cells but not as abnormal as a very high grade tumor where we see that we dip below about the 50 percent survival rate at five years with a very high grade um, quickly growing cancer so a low grade tumor would be slow growing less abnormal and high grade would be very quickly growing and high abnormality of cells then we have the tumor staging, which you should read the handout about, which I hope you understood because it's very straightforward. And people use the terminology of just stage one, two, three, four. And here, the lower the stage, the higher the survival. As we start to get up in the stages, um, their survival rate goes down. But we also know that there's not just the first stage, which is usually associated with the T, and the T is for tumors, so tumor size, the primary tumor. How big is the primary tumor? The N stage is for has it spread to the local lymph nodes? If yes, how many? M is has it metastasized? Either yes or no. So the full range of staging a tumor shouldn't just be stage one, two, three, or four. It should be how big's the tumor, is it in a lymph node, and has it metastasized? And we call that the full TNM staging. And please know how to do a description of that um, so that you could answer questions about it. Okay, so the final thing we have to talk about is just cancer therapeutics. Um, and just so you know, there's usually more than one way to treat a cancer. And when we use more than one thing together, that's just referred to as combination therapy, two or more agents. So we'll go through surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapy, which is a newer type of treatment that we're uh, seeing a lot of promise with. So typically, we see that the earliest intervention that's done is surgery. And if this is a small tumor and it hasn't spread very far and it's just a pr primary tumor, uh, this is still the first thing that surgeons and oncologists will recommend. So this is just going to involve the removal of the lesion or the tumor and then the surrounding tissue because as we know, Tumor cells like to get apart from one another. They have a lot of invasive capabilities. So 
they can be around in that area. So they want to take out the surrounding area, usually associated with the blood flow. So it's in a wedge shape. This is called a wedge resection. In lung cancer, you can take out a full lobe, a lobectomy. There's three lobes on the right side and two lobes on the left side. And you can definitely live with um, two active lobes on one side. You can actually live with only one active lung. A full removal of the lung is a pneumonectomy. So to give you a little uh, just tip, ectomy means to remove. So lobectomy means to cut apart. That's different than otomy, um, like a lobotomy, that means to cut into. Uh, so ectomy means to cut apart, which typically is talking about removal. And then you're probably familiar with the term chemotherapy. Uh, chemo refers to chemical and therapy is therapy. And you might remember this cell cycle where cells, they prepare for mitosis and then they go through these different phases and if you don't remember this, I want you to remember at least one thing is this M for mitosis. So chemotherapy is a non-targeted form of therapy. And what it states is the idea that cancerous cells divide really quickly. So if we can kill cells dividing quickly, then we're probably going to get a bunch of tumor cells. And we're going to kill them. But what I mean by nonspecific is that if this is a drug that, for example, targets every cell in the M phase, you would also target every labile tissue there was in the body. And if we think about the three main side effects of chemotherapy, the first is alopecia, which means hair loss. The second is GI distress. And the third is... Um, oh like lethargy, feeling tired. When we think about that then and think about cells that are highly labile, that means that they um, divide a lot, so they're almost always in the M phase. When we give this nonspecific drug, it doesn't just kill the tumor cells in the M phase, it'll kill everything in the M phase. There's also G1 drugs that target every cell in the G1 phase and kill that. So the reason you'll see, I don't know where that two came from, uh, things like hair loss, well, hair cells are very often in these phases. They uh, divide very rapidly. With GI distress, the GI epithelium divides really rapidly. So those cells end up destroyed. With lethargy, we see marrow cells destroyed. So there's anemia and there's tiredness. So chemotherapy targets every quickly dividing cell, and the hope is that it will kill the tumor before it kills essentially the patient, and they're going to count on losing their highly labile cells in the process. The same uh, principle occurs with radiation. Um, ionizing radiation physically breaks apart uh, DNA strands. And that means that they're not going to function normally, and that cell will eventually die. So we do know that if that cell doesn't undergo apoptosis, then it will become a cancerous cell, which is how radiation causes cancer. But in um, radiation therapy, it's concentrated doses of um, either IV or beam radiation given, given through a, like a laser to be concentrated to the specific tumor area to arrest um, tumor growth by physically breaking the DNA strands within the concentrated tumor area uh, and, again, hopefully arrest the growth of this tumor cell before it damages all the other cells around it. Uh, radiation is quite damaging to the body in the same way that chemotherapy is, a little bit more so. Um, you'll still expect to see uh, quickly dividing cells destroyed at the same uh, rate and a lot of pain and discomfort and nausea. So because those are two very nonspecific therapies and they're not really targeting a specialized type of cancer in most cases, they're just targeting quickly growing cells. The idea is to try to move towards more targeted systems um, that don't cause as many side effects and are specific for that patient's cancer type. So as I describe in the immune 
uh, introduction video, the way that antibodies work is they are matched to a pathogen in the body. And whenever your body seeds an antibody on something, it's like putting a sign on it that says garbage. So normal immune cells in the body, think about them as like a security guard and they're looking for things that say like, please remove, I'm dangerous on them. They're going to go by and see this and say like, these cells need to go. They're covered in the I'm dangerous signs. I'm going to destroy them and get my friends to destroy them. And yeah, now it's gone. So whatever antibody covers will be destroyed by the immune cells, which is their normal job. In immunotherapy, uh, when the pathology is done to determine the tumor type, um, they build up using a, like a donor, an animal donor, antibodies that are able to recognize a part of that patient's individual tumor so that it has an antibody associated with that tumor. So when that antibody is collected and then injected into the patient, that antibody will be attracted to the binding spots that match that patient's tumor. So they don't bind to just every cell that's quickly dividing. The antibody bind only to those tumor cells, meaning that when immune cells see them, they're going to come by and think those cells are garbage, and they're going to destroy them, which they are supposed to do anyway, destroy things with antibody on them. So here it's not using a drug. These are also called biologics, meaning it's using something uh, that's injected that resembles something normally made by the body, a biologic. So we're just injecting antibody, a biologic, resembling something we already have in the body, utilizing an existing system, like the immune system, and then having the immune cells take care of the cancerous cells for them. What's interesting about these immunotherapies, not only are they being developed very rapidly for multiple types of cancers, the number one side effect for immunotherapy is itching at the site of injection because you're just getting a syringe full of fluid and antibody. So it's just pain and itching at the site of injection, just like getting a flu shot. So that's a huge difference, not only in a lack of side effects, but just think about the quality of life and the more targeted therapies. Um, ability to recognize that patient's own individual cancer. So it's a very promising field. There's a lot of work at Roswell Park uh, in Buffalo, New York, going into immunotherapy right now. And it's a great field of medicine. I highly encourage you to check it out if you're interested. Um, another antibody approach, as we've mentioned, uh, VEGF, we know is secreted from ischemic tissues to encourage vascularization. If you can design an antibody against VEGF, then that is something that, again, can be collected, injected with a typical syringe with saline, bind to the VEGF, which will arrest the tumor's ability to grow. And that tumor, if it doesn't grow any bigger, it can't metastasize and it can't um, spread off its cells and then will arrest its growth. So it's a really, really cool way to approach more therapeutically and with far less side effects than our typical treatments. One of the coolest things uh, that we've seen is the use of nanoshell particles for drug delivery systems. Uh, they were doing some work on this at uh, Wake Forest where I went to graduate school. And this is a really great way to bring everybody together too because you've got biomedical engineers making these nanoparticles, which are, you cannot see them within the naked eye. They are molecular, they're very, very small. Um, and then you have the like cancer biologist uh, developing the pharmacology around this. So most of these have drugs in them. And then you have the physicists working together to develop a way to get these cells to respond to a specific wavelength of light. So it's really, really cool. So imagine this. You develop these little shells, and they contain a drug within them, or some of them have gold at the core. So when you heat up gold, if you've ever worn gold and like uh, blow dried your hair, it gets really hot. If you heat up a cell, we know you denature its proteins and you know cause injury. 
So if there's either a drug in there, there's gold in there, there's something cool in there. But they're designed to bind to this glycoprotein matrix that's specific to that patient's cancer type because we biopsied the tissue and we know what those cells look like. So we now designed a sticky part on these nanoshells to recognize these cells and only these tumor cells and just bind to them. So nanoshells, tiny little shells containing drugs. And they only become activated when they're um, in contact with the laser. So they coat these cells. They leave the healthy cells alone because they're not attracted to them. They only stick to the cancerous cells. Then the patient goes in, has a laser shown on the part of the body where the tumor is. It activates these shells to either release their drug or it heats up their gold core. And now those cancer cells are dead. And now these healthy cells are not destroyed. They're not going to leave. They are just fine. They have no nanoshells around them. And because nanoshells are so small, when the phagocytic cells come and break down these dead cells, they uh, physically are able to remove the nanoshells through the normal lymphatic channels in the body. It's amazing. This is one of the earlier animal studies uh, utilizing this technology to see if it worked and how well it worked. So they uh, used nude mice injected with tumor cells and they looked at the tumor volume. So with calipers, literally how big was this tumor? And they injected it with these uh, nanoshell technologies or uh, like the other side had no tumor and they just gave it saline just as a control on the one side. So one mouse or rat would be its own control as well. So that's got a tumor on one leg, no tumor on the other. So the rats go in, they have one pulse with a laser. So that'd be like a 15 second pulse of a light. <laughs> and then look at this, five days later, this tumor is having a little bit of abnormalities with growth and then it spikes a little bit. And then look at this, by day 10, we're back to the same volume of tumor growth as before or as what we see in the non-tumor side. And then we see it approaching zero by the end of a month. So one injection, one laser treatment, tumor gone through the lymphatic channels from the immune or from the cells in the body within 30 days. Absolutely amazing new technology. This is in clinical trials right now for a variety of different cancer types. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, same thing with treatment here. The number one side effect that patients report is discomfort at the site of injection, which is a lot different than what we typically expect from cancer therapeutics. So the future of cancer therapy is really bright. It's really encouraging and, um, and it should be hopeful. The other thing that we try to do also is look at ways to prophylactically which means in a preventative way, try to prevent the development of cancers. So this is an interesting little story about the development of a drug, and you'll find in pharmacology and in science altogether, a lot of things start as mistakes. So as, there was a drug that was made, and you may have heard of it because it's kind of popular right now. It's called tamoxifen. Tamoxifen was made by a drug company uh, hoping for a new birth control pill. And the way that it works in breast tissue is that it's an estrogen receptor antagonist. So taking you over to this picture, here's a cell. Estrogen and all other like um, steroid hormone receptors are actually on the DNA uh, because hormones are fat soluble and they go into cells. They find their receptor and they bind there. So here's some estrogen receptors and when estrogen binds to estrogen receptors, you get tissue growth. That's what happens during the menstrual cycle. Women, you know, the breasts get tender, they get kind of bloated. That's because the uterus is getting bigger. It's going through hyperplasia. Breast tissue is getting bigger. And so there's tenderness because estrogen equals more tissue growth. Um, so what we know is that tamoxifen wasn't a great birth control drug because it just blocked the estrogen receptor and it turned out that wasn't best for birth control. But what it did turn out to be is a really great way of inhibiting breast growth and tumor growth. So tamoxifen, it just blocks this receptor. So even if that person has a high amount of estrogen in the body, 
we've now blocked the estrogen receptor with that blood so that we can't have more estrogen, more tissue growth, more breast changes uh, throughout the month. Mm -hmm. So this is really cool. It works really, really well in the breast tissue for suppressing breast cancer. So let's say somebody found something abnormal in the breast or they've gone through breast cancer treatment and now let's prevent them from having a recurrence. They can take this drug tamoxifen to actually prevent the reemergence or the initial emergence of a breast tumor. This drug is only used now though for five years at a time because it turns out in the breast tissue, tamoxifen is an antagonist or blocks the estrogen receptor, but in the endometrium, where there's also tissue growth because of the hyperplasia that occurs for implantation, it's also an, an agonist there, which means it encourages tissue growth. Whoops. That's the way hormones work. They do something different in every tissue. So estrogen makes breast tissue grow, but it makes like the voice go higher. It's the same hormone, but it's just a different action depending on the tissue. So if you have too much estrogen in the endometrium, that's associated with endometrial cancer. That risk is quadrupled after five years of having endometrial cancer on tamoxifen. So patients are used or taking or put on that drug for five years and then either switch to another medication or uh, it's discontinued. Why do we still use it even though it has this risk of endometrial cancer? Because it works really, really well. So let me just show you um, tamoxifen use. Um, the Y is number of invasive breast cancers, meaning that's going uh, to different tissue levels, not just the tissue level of the breast it started in. In blue is placebo, so patients taking nothing, and in white is this drug tamoxifen. And if we put all women together on tamoxifen and all women uh, you know, taking a placebo tablet, uh, tamoxifen reduced by about 50% the number of invasive breast cancers. And then when we break that out by age, it becomes even more significant with age, meaning the older you get, um, the more effective tamoxifen is at preventing breast cancers. So as long as people are on it for less than five years, uh, we acknowledge that as safe um, and very, very good at preventing invasive metastatic breast cancers. So we went through a lot of different treatments, drugs, nanoshells, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, um, surgery. And if we can avoid these treatments by doing early screenings, finding the cancer when it's small, when we see the first signs of abnormalities, if we're just dealing with a small T1 NOMO tumor, that's the easiest to treat. So I hope you enjoyed learning about um, neoplasia. Here's your sample exam question. This is very straightforward. A client with cancer is being evaluated for possible metastasis of a primary GI tumor. Which of the following is one of the most common metastasis sites for cancer cells? All right, so if it's a GI tumor, we know that that's going to take the portal system, so the hepatic portal system. So taking that into account, liver, colon, reproductive tract, or white blood cells. The correct answer, I hope you've picked it, is liver. Remember the two most common secondary sites for metastasis are liver and lung, depending upon which blood supply the tumor is traveling through. So if it's the hepatic portal, it's the liver. If it's the pulmonary arterial system, it is the lung. Okay, let me know if you have questions. Perfect timing.